Hey, how's it going? Um, so today, um, what I want you guys to, to be doing is viewing this video lecture. So this video lecture is going to be on the, uh, the 14th Amendment. And it's just a brief history. It's only about nine slides long. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of walk you through, guys, through just like a brief history of that as um, for your unit of federalism. So before I start, one of the things that I really wanted to stress with you is um, <clears throat> the 14th Amendment arguably is probably the most impactful, most important amendment in the entire Constitution itself. Um, I mean, and one of those big reasons, and I will reiterate this throughout as we go through, is that that equal protection under the law um, over time has just been expanded and expanded and expanded from an, a Supreme Court interpretive standpoint that um, you, you really have this kind of umbrella of, you know, a nation of law and orders. And when we have an amendment that says you have equal protection under that law, um, it doesn't get more far reaching than that. Um, and throughout this, this kind of brief, uh, you know, PowerPoint lecture, hopefully you get an understanding of, of how far reaching and the implications of that. Okay. So the 14th amendment, just a brief history. Oh, and I'll also mention one other thing is that I want you guys. So when you're thinking of that, that unit driving question, which is how do we balance you know, the, this element of states, federal government, you know, how do we have a balanced democracy, right? Um, the 14th Amendment is key to this idea of, hey, who's got the lying share of the power on any given particular issue or situation? Um, so as we go through this, I want you to keep that in mind. How does the 14th Amendment tie into federalism? And how does it help us balance our democracy out? There we go. All right. So ratified in 1868, uh, the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. That included all former slaves. Um, they also uh, received equal protection under the law as stated in the Constitution. Ooh, typo there. I just caught that one. I'm going to have to delete that uh, once I'm done recording this. Um, and total, there are about five sections of the amendment. So it's not just like one section. Equal protection of the law is, is the thing that a lot of people will reference and remember if they know anything about the 14th Amendment. However, um, there are you know, other sections in there that are, that are pretty dang important to the overall interpretation and the scope that the 14th Amendment now has in modern America. So there was, of course, you know, some immediate backlash as, you know, the 14th Amendment is passed, well, after the 13th. And these are all, so Amendments 13 through 15 are considered what, are what is called the Reconstruction Amendments. So immediately after the Civil War, we enter into this period of Reconstruction. Um, many historians argue that, you know, Reconstruction has started, you know, before the war had ended. However, um, in this instance, there was some immediate backlash um, from uh, decisions made uh, that, you know, uh, freed the slaves, like the, four, like the 13th Amendment. And then you get the 14th Amendment, which then gives political authority to this very large, recently free group of, of black Americans. Um, because they're not just, you know, Africans anymore, right? They are black Americans because the 14th Amendment grants citizenship, okay, to people either born or naturalized in the United States, okay? So one of the immediate backlash of this, and some of these things that you'll see in here will kind of contradict, um, especially when I break down some of those further sections of the 14th Amendment, but a lot of former Confederate whites were overwhelmingly elected to serve in public office across the South. Um, in some provisions of the amendment of the 14th, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, anybody um, found to be an insurrection against the country um, is supposed to be barred from uh, holding or running for public office. Okay. So thanks to the Southern practice of black codes, and essentially what, the, you know, in a nutshell, those black codes were local policies that focused on ensuring that although black Americans had legal protections under the Constitution, they would be prevented from exercising those rights. One of those things being like the right to vote, right, the right to own property wherever you want to, right. Um, those black codes are going to be instituted in the South to prevent um, really a free existence um, you know, for um, black American citizens. Some of that backlash continued. Um, so 
the black codes would then give way to even more stringent and more codified laws now that we, we know come to know today as Jim Crow laws, which uh, were laws codified in the states that literally segregated citizens based upon their race, right? Um, and we've, we've talked about that before, and that will, of course, be a subject that, that will uh, continuously come up in, in class is that element of, of racial discrimination um, that is um, laced throughout American history. Um, and civics, is, civics um, and government is, is certainly no different. Um, so these black codes uh, give way to what ends up being codified and written down as Jim Crow laws. And this also then emboldens, you know, domestic terrorist organizations. So you see the rise of the KKK, also known as the Ku Klux Klan. Um, you may or may not know that, and that was started by a former Confederate general, um, started by a guy by the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest, um, who, one of, who was one of the, um, had a pretty formidable cavalry unit um, during the Civil War and was, um, you know, very impactful. I mean, a very efficient um, you know, group of individuals who were were good at their job. You know, and they were they were they were good. They were they were good at being soldiers. Um, so, and of course, to make matters worse with the Fourteenth Amendment is that um, the Fourteenth Amendment had no friend in the White House in Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was the only senator from the South that actually opposed secession. He was from Tennessee, and of course, Tennessee um, stays out of uh, the Civil War because it was a border state. Um, and Johnson was honestly key in keeping that from happening. So there, there was some good things that Johnson did. However, the things that he does after Lincoln is assassinated far overshadows any positives that he could have ever done in office. Um, he was a small farm slave owner, and um, a lot of historians believe that that's one of the reasons why he really tried and wanted to punish the South for the Civil War, um, because... He had some personal vendettas against the large plantation slave owner in the South um, because a lot of times that would kill small farms like his family had, um, and, you know, they would, they would just be struggling on a consistent basis. Um, you know, one of the primary reasons Lincoln leaves Kentucky, right, is because of these large plant, or the Lincoln family, before Abraham Lincoln is Abraham Lincoln, they leave Kentucky for um, reasons like that. You know, his dad was, the, the margins were getting thinner and thinner and thinner when he was farming. He wasn't able to make as much money with the crops because, you know, you had those large plantation owners that would just absolutely dwarf his level of production, and then they could undercut the price um, and drive small farmers out of business. Um, and that's been, you know, happening, you know, in America for, whew, gosh, as long as America's been a country. Um, larger businesses, commercial corporations, stuff like that have always driven out small businesses. Um and to continue, sorry, I know there's a little side there, and, and that tends to happen, but trust me, the, the amount of time that you're spending watching this right now dwarfs in comparison to probably what I would be doing to you in class uh, because I could drone on and on and on about a lot of these topics because um, you know, I love, love U.S. history, right? I love civics, love U.S. history. This is kind of my ballpark. So um, so one of the things that, that kind of displays, like the actions of Andrew Johnson, that, hey, you ain't got a friend in the White House here is that he vetoes both the 13th and 14th Amendments. Okay, so he vetoes those. Um, uh, uh, both, okay, are um, you know, overturned. You know, it's actually the first time in presidential history where a veto is, a uh, presidential veto is overturned. So Congress, of course, overturns those vetoes and codifies them into law anyway. So Johnson's veto, uh, more symbolic than anything else that he kind of, now, he did view this through a lens of states' rights. Right, which, however, is kind of an outward denial of 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 why he's vetoing it. Right, like he doesn't look at Black Americans as equal in any way, shape, or form. Right, I mean, he was a slave owner, crying out loud. I mean, he was clearly had, like many people in the South and the North, you know, a racist ideologies and understanding of the difference between the races. Um, and it's because that he uses this states' rights argument that he does miss the boat because that's the same mentality of course that allows slavery f to flourish in the south is that it is the rights of the states to decide on uh, what's acceptable within their borders um, and you know even gosh well over a hundred years prior to the civil war great britain had outlawed slavery already so they like it's not like we didn't see the writing on the wall right um you know the the elements of of slavery staying alive in the south um, 
you know, had a lot to do with uh, that, you know, some of that, like, elements of, oh, I'm a state, therefore the federal government can't tell me what to do. Um, so there, there's that element of, well, federalism, right? So that, that push-pull that's going on it, in this specific instance, that push-pull is an excellent example of federalism, right? Like, who has the power here? You know, Johnson favors, you know, government small g. He wanted the states to have control of that. Um, and then, you know, the 13th and 14th Amendment, of course, um, do tip the scales of, of the, and that balance of power more towards the federal government. Um, and we'll, we'll get to there um, here in just a moment. So some of the effects of, of the passage of the 14th Amendment. It does reject Dred Scott. So in conjunction with the 13th Amendment, both of these things reject Dred Scott so that no longer is a um, valid Supreme Court interpretation or decision anymore, which is important, right? You get rid of that notion that people are property. Um, arguably the most important and far-reaching amendment in the Constitution. I just kind of want you to think about that for a moment. Um, I mean, we are a nation of law and order. And if all of us are supposed to receive equal protection under the law, I mean, think of all of the things that we are, that the law governs for us. Um, and you have an amendment here that's saying you get equal protection of those laws. And I think, you know, we're all kidding ourselves if we can't throw a rock in any direction or pull up anything on our news feeds from social media or elsewhere to show that that isn't America, right? Like America, you know, equal protection of the law is subjective, very subjective, depending on who you are. Uh, where you're from, how much money you have in the bank, the color of your skin, you know, uh, sexual orientation, gender, all of these things, right, um, are all of part of this push and pull of that delicate balance that, that, I, that, that this unit is kind of um, the umbrella for, right? This unit is that umbrella of federalism and how federalism is this kind of give and take, this push and pull of, um, you know, the, the law and how you get protected. Uh, by using it. And over time, the Supreme Court has consistently expanded these protections of the 14th Amendment, um, and they end up including many rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights. So what do some of these other important sections say? Um, so Section 4, essentially, which, you know, this is kind of an interesting section, uh, um, as there are some, you know, obviously some uh, ten tenuous situations to happening across the country, especially when it comes to the most recent presidential election um, and the storming of the Capitol, so on and so forth. So Section 3 is kind of an interesting applicable section, at least now, based upon the discussion that I've been reading about that's going on in Washington um, in regards to the president inciting, um, you know, the, the riots that, that gripped the Capitol. So um, Section 3 of that amendment did say that if engaged in rebellion, um, or insurrection that bars you from holding office. Okay, section four: no compensation to former slaveholders for the loss of their former property. Which you know that should be a pretty pretty much a no brainer. Uh, we're not going to compensate you for you know property that should have never been anyway, right? Um, and then section five, and I did underline, bold, and highlight this for a reason because um, this is where this expands, right? So section five, I think, is is subtly maybe even the, the most important section. Because this talks about the future, right? And all the things that we might not think of today when this bill is being passed um, that could potentially be legislated in the future. And Section 5 says it tips the balance of power to the federal government because it allows for Congress to legislate and ensure that equal protection under the law for all citizens is carried out. And when you say that you can legislate these things when they come up, well, that is a pretty big and influential power to have. Um, so once the 14th Amendment happens, right, you kind of see the, the, the scales kind of tip a little bit more towards the federal government as opposed to the states, which, of course, Andrew Johnson was a big states rights person. So this definitely cuts against a lot of very um, contentious political ideologies that are gripping the nation at the time. Um, below, I just wanted to list some uh, a pretty important um, Supreme Court cases that all have uh, the 14th Amendment was like had major implications um, for uh, these particular cases. So some of those are and OK, again, I'll just kind of read through this. But all the following had major implications in the interpretation of the 14th Amendment and by extension, 
um, the balance of democracy that we call federalism. Okay, so Gitlow versus New York, that was free speech. Okay, um, Brown Board versus Education, which was 1954. That overturns Plessy. So Plessy was in 1896. That's a case that you guys had to do for homework um, this past Monday. Um, and Brown Board actually overturns that. You also have Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, which um, you know happens, I think, believe in the 70s. Um, and that is a, a contraception case. So, um, you know, like birth control, things of that nature. Uh, Loving versus Virginia, which is that that's the picture that I put up there um, for you. Um, this was actually an interracial marriage ban, um, which, you know, obviously is 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 obviously today and at any point in history. Right. Especially uh, being in an interracial marriage myself. Um, I find that that uh, decision to be particularly offensive to me. Um, and then, of course, um, the, the case that most I think most of you probably have heard of, um, if not, um, you've all heard of abortion. Uh, well, Roe Wade is the case that legalizes abortion in America, and that is actually to this day still the law of the land, although some states have found ways in which to kind of, I guess, circumvent um, you know, legalized abortion, or at least make it harder to obtain an abortion within their states. And just to kind of close uh, with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, especially, you know, it's kind of appropriate that I close with a Dr. King quote, um, especially since Monday um, is Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, and one of the things that the 14th Amendment, you know, that you have to understand is, is 1896 was Plessy, right? So you went a solid 60 years um, before um, the law was just being applied like it was originally intended, right? Like, you, you know, President Johnson had to sign a Civil Rights Act of 1964 just to, like, actually get rights that are already written and protected in the Constitution actually enforced. Um, so it took another 60 years. So that's why you see that heading of the wheels of justice are slow and grinding. And I think Martin Luther King, the, a very uh, influential and wonderful patriot and American, um, said it best, is that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice, um, is that, hey, you know, it, you know, America's tough, and it's going to take a long time to get the things that you need or the things that you want for your group and for your people. Um, but, the, the, you know, that, that arc, right, the, that, as long as it might take, you know, the universe has a way of writing itself. And Dr. King is letting you know that, hey, the suffering today will, you know, eventually get to a place of justice. Um, so uh, hopefully you, you enjoyed that video lecture. Um, I know it, it was about 17, 18 minutes long. Um, but, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a good amount of time where all you got to do is just kind of sit and watch. Um, and that, that's basically it. Um, so uh, now that you have a little bit more context around the 14th Amendment, um, maybe that will also help your understanding of that Plessy versus Ferguson case. Um, I apologize for things being a little out of sequence with me missing Monday. Um, I kind of had to uh, adjust on the fly a little bit because I was not expecting to miss class on Monday. Um, so I appreciate your patience here and staying with that. And uh, if you have any questions about this video lecture, you know how to get a hold of me. All right. Hope everybody's doing well and staying healthy. Bye.